Hello, everybody. As I mentioned last time, uh, uh, we are going to go through some transition and transformation to the better in Jacobs, and it will be significant transition and significant transformation. It's all positive. But because it is a transition transformation, we're going to have this type of uh, events um, for, for a while, monthly. And there will not be so much change on every event. There will always be a change. Uh, but in many ways, we'll present the same content in slightly adjusted way. We'll make improvements. We will get more of you to hear more of the content. And we'll get more of us all aligned around what we are planning to do. And so it's um, a bit um, boring. It sort of reminds me of uh, arithmetic lessons in, in school, uh, where uh, a lot of things which are presented are pretty obvious. But unfortunately, it is necessary for us to be aligned. And so with that, I'm clicking, but it's not clicking. OK, so again, a slightly different way to present. So again, I just want to remind you that um, we want to have Jacobs as a leading general purpose science-based university. And so role model university is Carnegie Mellon. And um, you know, again, some changes here. Uh, that I just want to point out that uh, it's uh, 20 Nobel Prize uh, laureates in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, most of them are reasonably recent. There are 13 Turing Awards. That's a very large number of Turing Awards. So it's one of the really leading universities. And it's number one in computer science and in arts and design for multimedia, which is in the future most certainly most relevant arts and design. You might have heard and read that one of the big trends of the world is creation of the metaverse, of creation of the virtual copy of the universe where the films are made, where the games are played, uh, where people interact. And that is all done with art and multimedia. It's also number one in information and technology management. These are very, very good professions and very, very good areas. But it also has number six in fine arts and you know many other good things. Mark is going to speak here. Again, one unique thing is that Mark is with uh, Carnegie Mellon in, since 1976. I was four years old, most of 1976. So with that, I can certainly tell you that it, it is about 45 plus years Mark is with Carnegie Mellon. And he was a provost uh, for 14 years, but more importantly, these were 14 very transformational years. That is the years when we finally realized that um, data science computer science, software engineering, machine intelligence are critical for just about every area of, uh, the, uh, of the human activities. And that is when uh, Carnegie Mellon was able to achieve its prominence. Um, and, and so, yeah, besides that, Mark is a board member for SIT, and he joined in as a board of governance member for Jacobs University. Of course, he's experienced provost, and he's been a dean of the college as well, so he played different roles. Um, and you know, I want to point out that Carnegie Mellon, just to explain, beside Mark, Mark I know for 10 years, but there is also a personal connection. My daughter went to Carnegie Mellon. It was a difficult journey for her, but she got uh, uh, with it really well. And so I have both personal and professional connection. Mark is a friend and a professional colleague, and my daughter went to Carnegie Mellon. So Carnegie Mellon, no matter what, is some university which I know really well, have been there tens of times. With that, I want to pass uh, the um, microphone to Mark. Mark, please join us online. I am not sure how you're going to be displayed here, but let me know when I should turn the slides. Thank you very much, Sergey. It's, uh, let me just say that if uh, all, all of our students were as bright and as creative as Alona Belosova, this would be a very easy business. She was a fabulous student. Maybe someday she'll be able to join into the connections with Jacobs as well. Um, it's really exciting for me to um, be in a position to see this next phase of Jacobs Uni um, University of Bremen. It's a tremendous opportunity, and I see a tremendous drive for success um, in ways that are going to be unique and, and, and important. Um, as Sergey noted, um, even though I look like a child, I was been at Carnegie Mellon for 45 years and, and counting, I guess. Um, it is certainly quite flattering to 
of Carnegie Mellon be thought of as a university that may have some lessons and stories of its own that could be relevant for Jakobs in its, in its journey ahead. And I'd like to say a very few words about that journey and try to be uh, quick about it. Carnegie Mellon came into being Carnegie Mellon 51 years ago. And at that time, Carnegie Mellon was a small, regional, I, I would even go to say local university. It was um, thought to be a solid place for local residents to go get degrees in engineering. Um, unlike Jakobs, which already has tremendous uh, outreach internationally with international students and so forth, 90% of Carnegie Mellon students at that time came from within just a small proximity to um, Southwest Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we were hard, hardly worldly. Um, we did not have wealth in terms of an endowment uh, or, or, or ma major donors. And we had some bright spots in terms of research, but to compare us to one of the Ivy Leagues or a Harvard or a Yale or something would, would have been absurd. And that's when our journey began with a um, new administration, basically, that came, that came into being. I will emphasize it did not come into being with a coup, it came into being with a great deal of excitement, as is the case, as is the case here. And it was led by a person named Dick Seyert, who was the president for over 20 years, and by a polymath named Herb Simon, which maybe I'll get a chance to say a word or two about in the future. And this new administration had some new agenda items for how the university could think about itself in its development. It had a number of principles, which I'll go through very quickly. One of them had to do with the concept of comparative advantage. Uh, the academic units needed to be strategic, which was at that time somewhat of a foreign concept. And, and and to determine the areas within uh, a field or subspecialties that would make sense for those units to strive to be strong in. Now, this also required patience and to believe in um, uh, what might be called a, a, a virtuous cycle. It's uh, one of these, uh, I don't know what, one of these yin yang truisms of higher education, sort of the sound of one hand clapping, namely that the secret to being successful is to be successful, and you need to be successful to continue to be successful. And that all begins, therefore, with the seed of how one proceeds in, 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 in given areas. It's only when one has established a certain lift off strength in a particular academic area, a field, in order for the other bright, young, ambitious folks who might be able to join, to want to join because of, because of that strength. <clears throat> um, a, 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 a second um, uh, principle that um, was adopted pretty much at the same time was a feeling that at least for what Carnegie Mellon wanted to be, the appeal of a rigorous um, interdisciplinary directions. Uh, we, we felt strongly that the most important problems that the world is facing and the most important breakthroughs in sciences and the arts were going to be interdisciplinary. And that was truly our bias, but our recognition that Carnegie Mellon had to try its best to find interdisciplinary ways to approach things was also just due to the reality that if we tried to take on existing great universities right in their disciplinary strengths, we would just be smushed <laughs> like a bug on a windshield. We had to find 
our own way to distinguish ourselves. Um, the third principle, which kind of links to these two, is simply that these comparative advantages, once they slowly began to kick in, should be synergistic and, and with one another and, 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 and should be compared to advantages one, one to the other. And then the last, I think, approach, and I know that Jacobs is in the same mindset, is it's ne necessary to take advantage of your strengths. And one of your strengths is to be, when you're young and small and ambitious, is to be willing to take calculated risks. You have to be recognizing that not all those risks are going to be successful, but things that aren't risky are ones that are not likely to be the things that set, that set you apart. Now, in the case of Carnegie Mellon, I'd be the first to acknowledge that it's often better to be lucky than good in the sense that we happened to put our marbles in the 1970s, 1980s, and we moved into the 1990s into things like human cognitive behavioral psychology. That was actually a huge starting point for us. Artificial intelligence, information systems, and as Sergey mentioned, computer science. And, and at the time that that was taking place, um, those kind of seemed both fuzzy, <laughs> sort of a motley disconnected group of areas. They were not easily defined in terms of the disciplinary approaches that other universities were pursuing. But they were our way of proceeding, and they were ways of proceeding that were important in the sciences, but they weren't important only in the sciences. They were important, they were our way to move into um, areas in the humanities, areas in the social sciences, uh, areas in uh, the arts. And Sergey, I guess there's a next slide maybe to go to, besides our picture. And, and, and this is uh, um, right behind here, we have a, a whole range of colleges and um, we were able to take the, these, this, these look like different colleges. They are different colleges, they're obviously in different areas, but a key for us is that they shared connection points, which are the ones that I had just mentioned. And as one area got stronger, it, it helped other areas get strongly as, as, as well. The, uh, the next slide, I think, and the last one for us, perhaps right now, I did mention earlier Herb Simon. Herb Simon was a, uh, uh, a polymath who, I don't know how one uh, creates such a person, but he represented these comparative uh, areas of computer science, artificial intelligence, and cognitive psychology. And if we turn to the last slide, I just want to emphasize that the ways that we were able and to um, promote what we were interested in doing was in areas very relevant for, for engineering, computer science, and the sciences, but equally College of Fine Arts in terms of art and design, in terms of multimedia, uh, in terms of um, the social sciences, in terms of the humanities, and in terms of public policy and um, information systems and, and areas today having to do with neuroscience or machine intelligence and so forth these things play out and are going to be the future of these domains as well now whether or not that takes place through meta i do not know but this they are now critical underpinnings in the humanities and and, and the arts as well um, i know that the path of Jakobs University, it's not going to be isomorphic with what Carnegie Mellon's story was, but there are enough similarities to where we've been and where Jakobs is, is going that I hope that while they won't look exactly the same, I hope they'll be looking back, I hope they will rhyme with each other, if, 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 if you will. Obviously, the journey ahead takes a lot of commitment, takes a lot of skill, takes a lot of energy. Um, I have known the primary shareholder of this new venture for, for some while, 
And if there's one thing I know, there's a drive and a track record not to not succeed. This is going to be a grand adventure. I look very forward to um, having a view of what's taking place. And I and my colleagues are very happy to help along the way in any way we might. So congratulations. It's an exciting time. And I see a very, very bright future. I will turn it back to Sergey. So, so, so I think uh, we identified at least one goal, which I've realized after looking at Mark's speech, is that we need to find a person. Um, and, and, you know, they started their journey 51 years ago, which is in 1970. And, and then in five years, he got a Turing Award, right? So we need to identify one of the faculty who will get a Turing Award in five years. The very same faculty have to get a Nobel Prize in eight years. And, and then, then we are off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people, how many other people in the world have Turing Award and Nobel Prize? I'm actually not sure if there is any. I, I think very, very few. I, I doubt that there is many, if any. Right. So, OK, with that, I, I just want to go back to, to my slides before I turn um, into Fabio. Uh, so. What we found here is still the same. I just added good educators. This is very, very important. I think one of the great uh, opportunity areas uh, in education globally is that there is certain um, uh, dis disdain and not enough attention to undergraduate education. Undergraduate education is very important. In my opinion, people from 18 to 22 years old have a prime ability to learn and even to do science. And, and somehow, uh, this is not an area which is g greatly attended, even in the places like Harvard and MIT. Undergraduate program in Jacobs is actually extremely good. And that's because there are good educators here. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't have to have a great master program, but that's one other thing. And you know, of course, the nice weather. I really enjoy the weather in Bremen. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, you know, another change, um, we, of course, not going to reduce, but greatly increase the workforce. So we're going to have to hire a lot of people. Uh, we've learned recently that um, a nearby community realizes that and already starting to build new apartments and, uh, and houses. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that will decrease the price of real estate. We do not plan to focus only on um, uh, computers and, and uh, physics and business. I do want to point out Carnegie Mellon is a role model to some extent, but we're not going to do the same as Carnegie Mellon. You know, in science, things don't wait for 50 years. We have to do things differently. We have to find and make bets in the areas which will be equally important, um, you know, 50 years from now. Well, I'm not going to live for 50 more years, most likely. So at least, you know, 15 years from now or 25 years from now. Uh, and, and so those are the areas which we'll be looking for. Um, you know, we do not have plans to eliminate social life or soft sciences. Last time there was a question, are we going to actually eliminate life sciences, not pay attention to life sciences? Life sciences are very important. And, and so we will definitely be present. Uh, no, you know, how are we going to get more money? I want to point out that, of course, we're going to have more students. That's very important. We have to have minimal number of students, even to the extent that we have to have enough alumni to be able to support the university, even to the extent that we have to have enough students to have a chance to have a percentage of them who will get Nobel Prizes and Turing Awards, because they're simply per certain percentages. If the university is too small, if it has 1,000 students, the chance of getting uh, great students is just not very high. And you know that will be adjusted by the fact that we will have even more students online, which will be a funnel to choose the best of them and invite here. We'll manage the assets better. It's not going to be so trivial. And for a while, it will going to be um, a bit disturbing on, on campus. Uh, one other thing which has changed, we're going to have managed, organized, and professionalized approach on how to get uh, various research and education and such as a funding from European Union, from Germany, from different research institutions. It is a private university, but it's non-profit. And it's fully eligible to get a variety of research funding. And we can organize the process much better, much more pleasant, and much easier for our uh, main, um, uh, main sort of members, which is, is a faculty or students. 
and you know, industrial research, endowment, fundraising, commercials, and spin-off. I've added here the story about this super wealthy institutions. You know, Harvard has a six billion dollars a year uh, budget with 40 billion of endowment, uh, which is probably more than most of German cities. Uh, but here is CMU. CMU is much more reasonable. Now it has three billion. It's still slightly more than uh, Jacobs. Um, but I want to point out the story of um, CMU. In 2001, it had only 756 million, and then it doubled this in 15 years, and then it's actually, uh, um, it's actually increased it 2.5 times um, uh, in, in five years more. And so it is possible uh, to find the money. A lot of people today are wealthy, and the one thing which you want to realize is that uh, a lot of people who became wealthy 100 years ago or 50 years ago, they became wealthy because of business, which was not directly related to science or technology. You know, some different businesses, real estate, um, agriculture. Today, every business is related to science and technology. And if you look at the uh, uh, lists of wealthy families and wealthy organizations and wealthy foundations uh, in the world, uh, uh, probably... 75% of money comes from science and technology. And so those people who made money this way, they understand the importance of good education and good science and interdisciplinary approach. And so I think it will be much easier for us if we professionalize fundraising to raise significant endowment. That's definitely our goal. Universities have to have reserves. It is completely unhealthy not to have reserves like uh, Jacobs um, always did. So another thing which I wanted to point out is that we're going to do much more marketing. So here I wrote three times the budget, but maybe even more. Most importantly, we will apply a uh, professional approach to brand, to digital marketing, to events, uh, to uh, being uh, a thought leader in science and education, to community. Uh, we'll use industry-grade tools for marketing. And we will do that because in our team, in our extended team, we have people who build these brands. So we have marketing people, either chief marketing officers or CEOs of these companies. And these companies are not any less famous. SAP, are you familiar with SAP here? Or Oracle, uh, or uh, Salesforce, or uh, Palo Alto N Network. And, and even in education, IMD, um, uh, with Jim Pulcrano, we have people who have participated intimately in building these brands. You know, and... It's always a question, how are you going to build a brand in education? You know, Harvard is whatever, 350 years old, right? Uh, by the way, Carnegie Mellon is, uh, what, about 150 years old in some form, or 100 years old in some form, right? Uh, but in reality, it uh, restarted 50 years ago. And in reality, to build a brand in, with the usage of modern marketing methods and with the, uh, with the application of proper team and proper processes, takes no longer than three to five years. Within three and five years, we can have a brand in science and education which is comparable to the top universities. Of course, it cannot be done without real science and real education. But marketing is very important, and we're going to do much more marketing. It will be noisy. You know, campus, uh, you know, not so much change. We're going to build 1,000 to 1.5 thousand beds. We hope to be able to do it by the start of the next year, um, uh, next study year. We're going to improve food and drinks. One of the guys of SIT, Anton uh, Grachov, who was on the picture here, now lives in one of the colleges, and he experiences uh, on his own uh, how it is to live in the college and what is the food in the college and what is the lifestyle in the college. We hope to be able to improve it. Uh, we'll improve the infrastructure and, and we will make internet, we'll improve physical security. I think it's critical for us to improve physical security. Uh, we are going to continue to stay, to be committed, with staying committed to be very diverse, to have students from all over the world. And with a larger number of students, we, we have to be worried about security. We'll bring venture capital and we are very happy to found some first interesting startup on campus. It, it is here. It's not uh, necessarily... Uh, um, yet um, next Facebook, but the concept which they have built is very interesting and it's potentially investable. And we hope to find more startups and generally 
as a private university, we have to develop entrepreneurships. We have to actually think about spin-offs and sp think about startups and think about making business, making entrepreneurs. At the end of the day, in life, there are those people who make more money and so they can help us more in the future. Entrepreneurs, most amount. You know, investors, second most amount, and then executives and people who are involved in large organizations like government organizations. And so entrepreneurs make the most money and we want to find more entrepreneurs, create more startups here. The other thing which I pointed out here, one more time, we're going to have an office of research support to help you. And we can do it already now. So if any of the researchers here, any of the faculties need help in getting funding, on figuring out funding, we can help it already now with uh, SIT resources. And with SIT extended resources, we'll, we will try to do our best to help you to get additional grants. European Union and Germany and the world are heavily investing in science and education. And um, it, it is possible to find more money. In many cases, it is just a matter of process. Uh, not so much change with long-term plans, because long-term plans are long-term plans, and we have to really live through next 12 months and rather next uh, 15 months, which are going to be a lot of work. But it's the same. We haven't changed since last month. So 5,000 beds, bed facilities, Olympic pool, um, cultural facilities, very important. Uh, modern um, universities strive on practically at the end one thing, clever students. Clever students are attracted by clever faculty. But clever students, more than clever students, they are Generation Z, and so they do want to have good culture and fort facilities as part of their life. That's how they used to live. When I was growing up, around me there was no sport facilities, and there was not so much culture, cultural life in, in where I lived. And so it was okay for me not to have it on campus. It is different for uh, young people today. Better food. Uh, you know, again, I don't think COVID will go away. It sounds like COVID is becoming part of our life one way or another. Even in case COVID will go away as this particular virus, um, uh, it will come back in the form of some other virus. So we have to prepare facilities like this to be uh, ready to function. What I see today is less people. Well, I just realized um, only five minutes after the event started that the reason why there is less people is because you have to have this in-between seats, right? And, and so, mm, We'll try to make life of professors much easier. I have brought, you know, faculty seen that I've brought a number of my uh, friends from my network here to come, including from a German universities, and they spoke to faculty, and one of the persistent complaints which we've heard is that um, there is much less assistance which the professors here get in, com in comparison to public universities in processing different auxiliary tasks, like preparing lectures or like filling some paperwork and so that can be improved and we can organize it. Arguably, we can organize it better than a public university. I will be surprised why would public universities be um, well organized in, in that regard. Uh, and, you know, Quantum Center, definitely something we com committed to beat. It's not just Quantum Center. It's basically um, part of Institute of Advanced Studies where the focus, our bet at the moment, is we believe that the long-term future is interdisciplinary approach is area of quantum technology, advanced materials, life sciences, sustainability, and machine intelligence. We believe that these areas are the areas of the next, um, next uh, 5 to 25 years where they are going to significantly change uh, how the world functions. And when I say machine intelligence, that of course applies, uh, go, goes towards not just machine intelligence, but also computer vision, also uh, augmented and virtual reality, also autonomous machines. And, and so those areas are connected with each other. And that's a current idea, but we're welcome to feedback. I will build a part hotel. That's definitely a problem with hotel. I mean, as we bring more and more senior people, it, it is clear that this sort of hotel situation is not very perfect here. So even the Atlantic Vegisac is not precisely close to walk. And so we need to have some solution, but it has to be sort of a four-star hotel, not a um, two-star hotel. And Tech Park for technology companies, again, we have to build entrepreneurship here. And with that, I, I want to uh, invite uh, Fabio Pamoli on, on stage, who is a member of SIT board, 
and who was a key member of SIT team making it possible for us to become um, involved with Jacobs, and he will talk about science and education. Thank you, Sergey, and thank you because of the fact that uh, And thank you because you and SIT gave me the opportunity to, to discover and to learn about uh, Jacobs, about this community and about uh, the project that then we started to work on. I will start with a personal footnote, just as a coincidence, I will say, it, which I believe is a fortunate coincidence. When I was 19, I went to the library and I was dealing with uh, some problems uh, at the crossroad between uh, economics and, and math. And I went through a paper by a guy I didn't know about because it was not part of our curriculum, which was Herb Simon together with uh, Ando. And it was a paper about causality in, in economic systems. And then this guy never left me and never left my research and my activity. Mm -hmm. And when we came to study economic growth, I remember a discussion that I had with him in Pittsburgh many, many years ago about proportional growth and preferential attachment. And uh, we discussed about the Bose-Einstein statistics as a concrete possibility to model processes of economic growth at different levels of aggregation. And that discussion became the source for a collaboration with Gene Stanley and then articles and a book. And then the multidisciplinary approach that Mark Camlet and Sergey have been mentioned is even kind of deeper than simply, I would say, um, I want to be provocative, the Turing Award and the Nobel Prize in Economics because it was embedded into cognitive psychology, into philosophy of science, into the introduction to production systems in artificial intelligence. And so it was really at the crossroad between human intelligence and the design of the systems we live in. So two suggestions, especially for the students, there is a wonderful autobiographical book that he wrote, Models of My Life, which is also about community building, and it's about campus life, and it's about diversity, and so it's about the culture that, uh, that we found and the potential that we found here. And another one is the sciences of the artificial, in which you have uh, really this combination between humanities, cognitive psychology, and, uh, and quantitative sciences. Sorry for, for this introduction, but there are concrete elements. Sergey already mentioned the importance of campus life and campus infrastructure and campus development as a key ingredient for this uh, transition and transformation. Another component is how we interact and we will interact uh, transforming the crossroad and the nexus between research and education, which is going to be key in a multidisciplinary oriented university as Jacobs. Because this is really the competitive advantage of this university keep this deep relationship between research and education to expand the multidisciplinary components uh, which uh, we are working on. We, we are discussing with the faculty about how to reinforce and strengthen the backbone that can connect the different programs that can offer opportunities to students to enter the new digital and to enter the new digital with new skills so that uh, Jacobs becomes the best private university in Europe, not only because of the fact that uh, students come from all over the world and they have practicums and they have the opportunity to enter their la labs uh, as other students do not have in other universities, but also because of the fact that we create uh, a common ground of methodological courses that strengthen their own individual capabilities and personalities and identities. So this is the work that we are doing together with the faculty. And in order for us to do that, and I will stop in a, in a few minutes, in two minutes, we need also to act on the physical infrastructure within the campus so that uh, our lecture halls can become adequate to have courses that are taken by multiple, by, by students coming from multiple programs then we need to develop further the infrastructure which will allow us to go hybrid. So to combine in campus, in lab, 
with online education. And this is also going to be the object of our partnership with Alemira in order to have advanced learning uh, 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 management systems and advanced solutions to sustain even laboratory life. Then you see some, some of the ingredients, but, but Sergei already introduced them. I want to focus on a few elements. First, coding for everyone. We will introduce introductory courses since the very beginning for the students of all the programs so that they have an opportunity to be proficient and to become proficient and to learn and to be part of the new digital transition simply because of the fact that they are exposed to coding and, and, and we will do that. Another point is data, data analytics across different domains. Part of it is domain specific, part of it is general purpose, and we need to design this combination between general purpose and domain specific contents. Then, in order for us to do that, the backbone I was mentioning is not going to be a substitute for the disciplines that we found, it's going to be kind of a complement and a way for us to leverage the diversity in terms of disciplinary background that we found in the campus. So you see some of the, of the, of the thoughts. In, First, reintroduce and reinforce and strengthen master programs and PhD programs in order to re-establish and to strengthen the nexus between research and education. Second point is to introduce stronger contents in computational methods and mathematical modeling in physics, computer science, software engineering, business sciences, and also relevant for humanities and political sciences. Uh, I, will, uh, I will stop here. Then also we will have uh, online programs, because we need to expand, as, as Sergei mentioned, critical mass is an issue, because we want to show that the combination between financial sustainability and excellence in research and education is not an oxymor, it's a necessity. And in order for us to show that it's not a contradiction in terms, but it is a necessity, we need to grow in size. And Sergei already explained that. So I will stop here. You see that the ingredients of the pie will include also reference, not only to, to scientific excellence, but also to relevance for society and for your, for your own careers and life and families. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to, to say. And thank you again, Sergei, for the opportunity to... One last point on this slide, uh, which I want to emphasize uh, and will continue to emphasize more and more, that ultimately I'm agnostic and not a religious person. But at the same time, I could be perceived as a very religious person because I believe in knowledge through science. I believe in knowledge. Believing in knowledge is not so dif different than being religious. You know, there is no reason to otherwise believe that knowledge is a good thing. You cannot really prove that knowledge is a good thing. You can use knowledge in a variety of bad ways. And, you know, science in some ways is like a church because the church is what is a process of getting to God. And the same, science is a process. I believe in that process to get to knowledge. And so we're going to have, we're going to make sure that everything we do is driven by science and knowledge. And, and so that is definitely uh, something which we believe is necessary and important, but not just to be excellent, but also to be financially viable, to be sustainable and to be pragmatic. We believe that science and knowledge is required to be actually financially viable as an institution, long-term sustainable, and this is a pragmatic approach for the future. This is the only approach for the future. With that, I wanted to talk about several household items. So first of all, this is our um, uh, board of governors. We have not announced it yet. We're going to have a first meeting of the board of governors uh, today. Uh, there are going to be 18 people now on the board of governors. Some people are new, like um, some people are also old people who were on the board, Rainer Kuttingen, Stefan Rassler, uh, Antti uh, Boyeto, sorry, my pronunciation of some German names is not perfect, Dorothy Dzwonek, um, um, Jürgen Zollner, 
uh, Gerald Weffer and Philip Rosler. They are staying on the board. Uh, we are very happy to bring back to the board Peter Lursen, who was on the board before. Um, and, and hopefully, maybe we will get some other people. In addition to that, the Board of Governors is up to 20 people. I want to point out that we will create an executive committee, which will be a smaller committee, which will meet much more often, possibly monthly or even more often, which will actually be directly involved with, with, a, with a leadership of the university. And then, of course, there is myself. I have to be on the board. You know, I'm, I'm a chairman. That's an unfortunate feature of being a shareholder. Um, then uh, Professor David Basin. David is here today with us. He is um, um, a professor of computer science, head of uh, Security Institute uh, in ETH, uh, which is one of the best computer science universities in the world. It's always in top five, top three, together with Carnegie Mellon. And um, you know, Professor David Basin not only is professor in Switzerland, but also has been a professor in Germany for uh, five years. For us, computer science and cybersecurity are super important. And he is a scientist on the board, but he also has founded several startups. So he uh, could bring us both entrepreneurships and science. Jochen Berger is a, a very successful uh, 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 German uh, in entrepreneur in technology. You can go to his uh, website. You can search him online, BrainWeb. He is investor in several multi-billion dollar and multi-ten billion dollar companies, self-made. Uh, he is very German, very much here. I hope to get him involved operationally, helping me figuring out various aspects of running this university. Yeah, I forgot to mention Tim Gordon. Of course, he stays on the board uh, as well. And that's a lucky thing for us. Mark Kamlet joining the board with his experience overlooking. He's been through Carnegie Mellon from 1976. In 1976, nobody knew who Carnegie Mellon is. It was some small, strange university in Pittsburgh, still, even five years from now. Even, you know, even though the, the, you know, the, the, the Turing Award was already received at that time in 1975, it, it was not enough to make it as famous. And, and then by now it's number one in the world. And, and it's arguably in the industry is most recognized university. Uh, it, the best industrial leaders in, in very complicated technology for industry come from Carnegie Mellon. It's much easier to deal with Carnegie Mellon graduates in companies like Acronis or VMware than with, with graduates from Stanford or uh, Harvard or MIT. Rafael Laguna, he's an entrepreneur. He's also managing director of Sprint.gmbh, which is a federal agency for disruptive innovation, which is a very large funding agency, which is dealing with the same problem we're trying to deal here in the European Union and in Germany in trying to make science and education a little bit more focused on business and on the entrepreneurship and on spin-offs. And, and so it's very much aligned. He's again here, not far, Yelena Novoselova, already mentioned Peter Lorson, uh, is, was a head of um, Graphene flagship, and still is one of the leaders in Graphene flagship, which is uh, one of the um, uh, flagships uh, in, uh, well, I don't remember, Horizon something in, in Europe. Uh, so she will help us in understanding modern uh, Funding, funding for the sort of very modern physics. Uh, in, in the last years, it was neuroscience, graphene, and uh, quantum technology, which was as funded. Uh, Sasha Spawn, new member of the team. Sasha, of course, uh, has a great experience of rebuilding a public university not far from here, Lufana University uh, in Lunenburg, uh, as much as it's possible to look like a modern private university within the limits of German public university system. Uh, he's at the same time a professor of the University of St. Gallen. Uh, this is quite an amazing member of the team because he has an experience in both public system for 14 years, I believe, right? Or 16 years, if I'm not mistaken. Where is Sasha, by the way? He, he, he's on the tour or what? Ah, conference call. Okay, well, but he's here today for the Board of Governors. And again, uh, Lunenburg is about one hour drive from here, so he can be uh, directly involved in helping to guide the university. As you see, we have uh, Fabio Pamoli um, um, as a member of SIT team, 
uh, involved here, who was a rector of uh, university in Italy. We have Sasha Spoon, who was a rector of the university in Germany. And we have, of course, Mark Kamlet, who was a rector of the university in the US. Matthias Winter, who is here today, he is a senior partner of McKinsey, um, basically one of the leaders for technology practice of McKinsey in Europe or in Switzerland? In Europe, uh, you know, McKinsey, this, this strange organization. Uh, so they, they hopefully will be helpful. Ilya Zubarev is my partner and also technology entrepreneur. His background is very similar to mine. We basically did everything together in our career. I'm a public person. He's a private person. I'm more entrepreneur. He's more of an investor. You know, I always uh, like to tell people that I make money and uh, I spend money and he makes money. So that's uh, once he make money, I will spend it to make more money. Right. So then um, the same slide about the culture. So we are going to go through transformation, transformations, even positive transformations in my experience. And I went through several, just two in my career are never very nice. They are always complicated. There is always some um, uh, sins uh, to worry about. There is a lot of changes. And so this is entrepreneurial formula. I will repeat it many times to stay responsive. Just because there is a lot of change, you don't know what to respond to. You cannot organize things. You can better be responsive to everything. To stay always alert, things are changing. It's not relevant what was happening three months ago. It might have been completely different um, in one hour ago. Focus on details. Every detail is important. The most important things are details. The large things don't matter. The details are much more important. Make decisions. We are not super well organized organization yet and definitely not in comparison to a three times larger organization which we have to be or five times larger organization which we have to be in, in say five years that is just a different organization today we have 450 people uh, it's completely different you manage 450 people or 2.5 thousand people right and and so it's just a different way to run things and so uh, making decisions will be very much need to be done um, by uh, members of the team. Don't be afraid to make decisions. The worst thing is not to make decisions. Be afraid not to make decisions. Never give up. You know, very often you hear since we cannot do this by next year. It's already too late. This takes too long to certify. What I found in entrepreneurial ventures, and that's the only way. You have to understand, who do we compete with? Uh, it's, it's very easy. We compete with guys like this, uh, with, with these guys, like with these guys. Right? All these guys, right? $40 billion in endowment. $6 billion budget. That's, um, you know, 100 times larger than our budget. And, and they have only five times more students. Or well, yeah, maybe these guys have 10 times more students, but it doesn't matter. So the only way to win is to do something different. And if we can do something different by never giving up, uh, every time we cannot do something, in reality, we can still do it. We can still uh, certify a program by next year. We can still build more beds by next year. We can still build a research center by next year. We can still hire somebody whom we think we cannot hire. And even in case the person refuses to be hired, we can still hire him later, and so on and so forth. And then ambition, important to, stay, to have ambition. If you don't have ambition, in my opinion, it's just uh, not, not fun to live. Ambition is a lot of fun, but our ambition is to be number one, and not just in Europe, but in some fields in the world. And that's our ambition. And it's totally possible to get done, because everything um, which is done, and this I'm quoting Steve Jobs, is done by people who are not much smarter than you. So, you know, it's just done by people. We just need to work with, like other people. They also have two hands and two eyes and mostly two ears. A in initiative, you have to take initiative. That's something we can do because we're small. Remember, Mark Kamlet mentioned that we have to take risks. And so risks means also take initiatives. Take risks first. Don't wait. We have to be uh, uh, empathic to each other and understand how we operate. And so that's why we are organizing this meeting. We need your feedback. Uh, we have to have the right frequency because, again, there is a lot of changes. And there is no really good way to go through the changes without mistakes. We're going to go and make a lot of mistakes. And the only way to deal with it, if we actually have high frequency and do a lot of events, then we can correct mistakes as quickly as we make them. Passion. We have to acquire passion. We're going to do more and more 
to get people passionate around this cause of making this into a great institution, despite uh, the difficult odds. And, and uh, care, everybody should care about every part of the process. That's what is meant in this formula. So even though you are a student, you might care about, um, uh, about uh, the quality of the food or you might care about the quality of the security on campus, or even though you're a uh, professor of um, sociology, you might care about the quality of education in German language. It, it doesn't really matter. You, we, we are a small team. We, we can uh, be interdisciplinary and interfunction much more than, than the large established institutions. 25 years from now, that will be different. Maybe even 10 years from now, it will be different. But now, in a transformation time, um, um, we, we can be much more flexible. And so that's my formula of entrepreneurship. And I think that's what we need to try to get used to. It is sounding very glamorous and, and very glorious, but it's actually quite often not as pleasant. And that's why I remind you that what is very important is to align. And you know, alignment is important in the areas of transformation, on, in the areas of storm, on during the, any transition, or during war, or during crisis, because Alignment is important for people to be aligned together around common goal because if the, you are not aligned with the rest of the people, it is not bad for them, but it's bad for you. It's bad for everybody. And so there is certain price to pay for alignment. This is a story and this is a book I recommended to read. Anybody read this book yet? Whoever read this book, send me, send me your opinion. about. It. It's quite a long book, but it's well written. And the point is that one very well-funded operation uh, did not succeed because it was not aligned. And one not very well-funded operation very much succeeded and is famous for getting to a South Pole uh, because it was originally aligned and yet it was even more so realigned. And that's, in my opinion, one of the stories of this book is a leadership. You know, I'm getting a lot of comments from um, public universities, professors uh, who visit me, especially from German ones, Wow, Jacobs, that's very challenging. It, it is not going to be so easy to make this thing fly. And I want to tell to Jacobs team that you have to realize that Jacobs is already flying and it's already very much flying better than vast majority of German universities. Because yes, it's losing money. That's the only problem really. I mean, it's really the only problem. But every German university loses 100% of its budget. It doesn't make any money. And so you somehow make money. You are better than every German university from financial standpoint. And so you should be proud of that. So there is no reason to think that we, we should uh, not fly. We will fly. The question is that we have to be ambitious and fly high enough. Yeah, with that, I just want to point out that, um, you know, it's nice to do what you want or to do what you should, but really it is not a good idea. The good idea is to do what you can. And so we're still figuring out as a team from SIT, as a new governing board, as a, some new members of a Jacobs team and um, leadership team, that what we can do with that, we will have to understand precisely what is the opportunity. So for example, should we focus on um, sustainability? You know, sounds like it's a great focus. I, I'm reading more and more and realizing that this is a huge problem where there is a lot of money and a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity and it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, sustainability is what you actually should do, right? And, and life sciences is what you want to do, right? And, and then um, you, you have, um, you know, very much um, things like um, advanced materials and computer science, what you maybe can do now. And then machine intelligence, something you, you definitely can do now. But we have to figure out precisely what's the opportunity in science. At the end of the day, universities are about science. Education comes through science. Knowledge comes through science. Then, of course, we need to figure out and improve our opportunity, our ability to execute. We can need to create a strategy, differentiated capability and focus. We don't have it yet. This is not a strategy. As I mentioned, this is what at the moment we want to do, but this is not yet a final strategy. And so we're going to iterate. And I've yesterday mentioned to somebody that I think we can be able to present a good strategy in the town hall of this kind around the middle of April next year. And so at that time, we will likely be able to have a good strategy, which will be supported by a good plan, which will be supported by proper financial means and resources, but not much earlier than that. 
again, um, SIT is becoming more colorful, and I want to point out that we added Jakob's color to the pattern, so we are listening, Stefan, to you. Um, uh, so I even have a new shirt on me today, you see, SIT, and it has Jakob's color on it as well. And so I think it's important that we want to be diverse in the sense that we want to offer a choice. We cannot be a single color. We have to give um, our students and our faculty a choice to choose from sort of s pattern set of corporate colors of what they want to do, which shirt they want to wear, you know, a green one or a blue one or a, you know, navy blue one or a red one. Um, but I will still wear this. So, you know, I'm committed to this color. I, I have a lot of investment in jeans. And so they are all blue, so changing to any different color will be way too cumbersome uh, for me. And with that, uh, we uh, uh, want to listen to get your questions. Uh, Fabio and I are here. I can see Mark is still there, so we can get your questions. And I just want to remind you, join us at this wonderful SIT and Jakobs Insight on Technology Conference. This year, it is organized in a hurry. Nevertheless, we have a lot of people signed up. Uh, for both online and offline. We have very good speakers. Uh, we have our, our chairman of the board for SIT, Konstantin Novoselov, here in person, giving a speech uh, about what he does in the area of advanced materials, which is one of the most exciting areas, completely interdisciplinary, which also involves uh, condensed matter, quantum technology, uh, chemistry, involved life sciences, and involved computer science and machine intelligence. And so he is here on campus. Please attend it or please listen to it online.